What do you think about, I love Jesus? I love Jesus. I love Jesus. What were you reading that undermined the words? The body language. Music has body language, friends. So what if I'm playing a song? I love Jesus. I mean, do you see almost how silly it is when we start thinking it through? I'd like to welcome you to the third presentation of 10. So far, has the information made sense? Yes. Yep. How about that, that first message for you that were here last night? What did you think about the, the, the crystal molecules that were formed in that frozen water when that good music was being aimed at it? Wasn't that fascinating? And the fact that inorganic substances could be vibrated and create amazing patterns. And then we talked earlier about how the mind is so incredibly intricate and fascinating and that the battle is for what part of the mind? The frontal lobe, that's right. And what part of the frontal lobe? You guys are excellent students, praise the Lord. The prefrontal cortex, that's exactly right. This particular message is entitled Motive, Music Mechanics and Body Language. Now, motive, you may not know this, is actually a musical term. A reason for doing something, especially one that is hidden or not obvious. Now, this is what the typical people, thank you, uh, everybody just reminded me to pray. I appreciate that. So let's actually have a quick word of prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we can come together and reason. I pray that you would help us to understand music to a better degree, the power and even the dangers. In Jesus' name, amen. So motive, typically when you hear motive, it's a reason for doing something, especially one that is hidden or not obvious. So if someone says they have a motive to take over the world, then we know, oh, that's kind of a hidden agenda. In music, there can also be hidden agendas. Now, in musical terms, motive is a fragment or succession of notes that has some special importance or intention. So in music, what's amazing is that in every piece of music, there is a motive. And this is something that I hope some light bulbs start going off in your mind this afternoon. Now, one important question that many Christians have asked is this. In a song, is it the music or the lyrics that matter the most? Have you ever wondered that question? Is it the music or the lyrics that matter the most? Well, Sandy Patty said, music is a very powerful force. Is she right? Absolutely. It has a way of breaking down barriers. She's right there as well. But a lot of artists are taking that very powerful tool and putting negative, horrible lyrics to it. And those lyrics are getting into the hearts of the listeners and are shaping their values. She is dead on. That's exactly what's happening. Why can't we, i.e. contemporary Christian musicians, take that same powerful force music and put positive lyrics to it and begin shaping values that way? So what you may not understand, the subtext of this is what she believes is that only the lyrics really matter. So yes, music has wonderful power, but it really is only the lyrics that have the moral content. And we're going to explore that. David Meese, he was a CCM artist, uh, big in the 80s, and here's what he said. Basically, you have to focus on the lyrics, what the song is saying. That is my criteria to decide whether the song is right or wrong. It has nothing to do with the musical style. It has to do with the lyrics, what the song is saying, what are the words saying. As Christians, we can objectively judge it from that standpoint. So we have CCM artists that believe, and CCM, if I refer to that, that means that, that CCM is contemporary Christian musicians um, or the music industry. CCM proponents typically will say that it's only the lyrical content that matters. However, when you have someone like Professor Marshall McLuhan, he has a different view on this. Now you have to understand, McLuhan's work is viewed as one of the most, of, of, as the cornerstone study on media. He's a professor, a philosopher, and a scholar, and here's what he says. The medium, he's referring to music, the medium is the message. That is to say, the music, the melody, harmony, and rhythm, all by itself 
disposes a man to virtue or vice by moving the emotions. Therefore, the way in which they move the passions should serve as a principal basis for judgment on whether any given piece of music is good or bad. Interesting. So we have some on CCM saying, you know what, it just doesn't matter what we listen to as long, or what the music bed is, as long as the lyrical content is okay. Yet we have others saying, wait a minute, if it's moving the emotions, pushing and pulling and raising and lowering and making them suggestive and sexual, then we need to evaluate that. And we can start to base our decisions on how it's actually pulling us. And this will become clear as we move through the weekend. Brain specialist, Dr. Richard Pellegrino, he declared that music had the uncanny power to, quote, trigger a flood of human emotions and images that have the ability to instantaneously produce very powerful changes in emotional states. Instantaneously. Boom! I can change it that quick with music. Take it from a brain guy. In 25 years of working with the brain, I still cannot affect a person's state of mind the way that one simple song can. That's powerful. So the scientists are realizing, man, there's a lot going on in music. So the question is, can music alone influence the listener? Not songs with lyrics and that type of thing. So the question is, can music alone influence the listener? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try a little experiment. Everyone, when I tell you to please close your eyes and we are going to listen to a couple clips. They're only 15 seconds long. And then when we're done, I'm going to ask you a question or two and then raise your hand to give me the answer. Okay, are we ready? Okay, so everyone close your eyes and if you're viewing at home, close your eyes as well. Here we go. Can music alone influence the listener? Alright, so how did that make you feel? Someone raise their hand and tell me how did that make you feel? What did that make you think of? Yes. Happiness. Happiness, okay, great. Yes. Disneyland, Disneyland okay. Patriotic. Patriotic, okay. Yes? Oh, of, of like a horse or something, okay. So how did I know to put this on the screen before I knew what you were going to say? I knew you would say that you were happy, patriotic, some people have said colonial, that type of thing. Because the music itself has a motive and we experience music in the context of our living. And so for Americans, that would seem very patriotic. I played this sample over in Sweden and they go, I don't know how it makes me feel. Because that to them is not a patriotic American sounding type piece of music. Very interesting. All right, close our eyes. Okay, how'd that make you feel? Yes. Scared? Mysterious. What? Mysterious. Mysterious. Scared. Little Dill Pickle said scared. He's my little buddy. Yes. Suspenseful. So again, I'm not a genius. I knew you were going to answer eerie and scary. You know why? Because music is a universal language. We respond, by and large, the exact same way to the music. Close your eyes one more. Okay, so yes, oh, hands shot right up real, yes, yes, man. Happy, playful, anybody else? Yes, energetic. So how did I know that? Begin, because it is a universal language, and we respond to music in the same way. My friends call that the froggy song, because they vision, visualize in their, in their mind little froggies lumping, jumping around and having a great time. Dr. Norman M. Weinberger, professor of neurobiology and behavior at UC Irvine Research, his research confirms that, quote, music can rapidly and powerfully set moods 
and do so in a way not easily attained by other means. So music can set and influence emotions and moods almost instantaneously and very powerfully. So within a 10 to 15 second clip, you were already feeling scared. You were already feeling happy. That's the power of music. Is that making sense? All right, a couple more. Close your eyes. Now, with just a verbal expression, how'd that make you feel? Do it. Do it for me. Ah, exactly. Because we as the human biology, the human physiology, the human makeup respond the same way. Close your eyes. That was peaceful and tranquil. <laughs> How'd that make you feel? Stately. Majestic. Bum, 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 deep, ba, la, 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 right? Waiting for the king and queen, perhaps. Now, when I played that one in New Zealand, we had some uh, British over with us, and they said, oh, here comes the queen. <laughs> I said, oh, we don't have one of those, but that's what they, the emotion it evoked in them. Isn't that awesome? How about this last one now? Okay, how'd that make you feel? Yes. Being chased, okay. You're in a journey. Scared. And a, what was that? Dramatic. And many people, yes. Mysterious, okay, excellent, yes. Anxious. Isn't that amazing? We have all these emotions in 10 seconds. Oh, music doesn't matter. Now, what, let me ask you a question. What lyrics told you to feel that way? Hello? What lyrics? There were no lyrics, my friends. And yet it was telling you what to feel. Would you say music is powerful? Oh, yeah. Now, let's bring it together for you. Since it was influencing our thoughts and our feelings, that has moral implications. Review and Herald, April 21st, 1885. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and feelings combined make up the what? Moral character. I hope you got that. Because the reality is, if anything is causing us to think a thought or feel an emotion, it has moral weight to it. Amen? Because the argument is, oh, music is, is amoral. In other words, there's no moral component to it. Therefore, we just have to put good lyrics on it and everything is okay. Is that true? Well, not in light of these statements and what science is saying. When we decide that we as Christians are not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings, I'll listen to whatever I want to. I don't care if it makes me feel sensual, if it makes me do whatever. I don't, I'm just going to do that because that's what I want. When we decide that as Christians we are not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings, we are brought under the influence of what? Evil angels. And we invite their presence and their control. You see, there is a spiritual side to music, my friends. The devil wants to control us with it. And certain kinds of music open us up to evil angels controlling us. That's heavy. Is that heavy to you? Yeah, this is not a toy that we're playing with. And music is not just ambiguous. Music has a very deep moral component to it. If anyone tells you it's only the lyrics that matter, they are don't know what they're talking about. They're uneducated. That's it. We don't fault them. We try to share information with them. Amen? Robert Palmer. <clears throat> In the book Rock and Roll, An Unruly History, he states this, I believe in the transformative power of rock and roll. 
this transformative power adheres not so much in the words of the songs, but in the music itself, in the sound, and above all, in the beat. So here we have science saying it affects us. We have spirit of prophecy saying it affects us. We have the rock and roll industry. We could, I could put quotes up here all day long that say they understand this. And yet we don't want to because frankly we, want, we just want to argue for what we like. That, I think the Lord might classify us as a stiff-necked people if that's what we do. Graham Cray. Now you have to understand where this is coming from. He's a former chairman of the Greenbelt Fast Festival, a three-day Christian music event. And it features groups from hardcore to classical, acoustic to junk funk. And this is what he said. In all pop music, lyrics are secondary. Pop is music of feeling, spoken primarily to the body and only secondary to the intellect. That's powerful from the guy that's putting on a festival that has all kinds of music. So now let's think this through for a moment. If we have a spiritual word and a spiritual photo, for instance, and we'll see here that we have, we have both S's present. That means the S is for spiritual and the S is for spiritual photo. So if we have spiritual words and a spiritual photo, would that be okay for the Christian to behold? Let's say we have a beautiful picture of, of an apostle, for instance, and there's scripture on it. There's Jesus, even better, and there's scripture on it. Would that be great for you to behold? There's nothing wrong with that, amen? Now, what if you had, if you had uh, non-carnal words and a spiritual photo? Would that be okay? Sure. What if it had a beautiful picture of, of a mountain and it said, you can climb to the top, go for it, or something like that. You can do it. Would that be wrong for us to behold? No, because the, the, the spiritual, uh, non-carnal words, excuse me, they're neutral, if you will. And the spiritual component is present, which would be maybe, maybe not necessarily spiritual, but a, an ambiguous type neutral photo. But now what if we had a spiritual photo and carnal words? Now, what do I mean by carnal, by the way? Let's define carnal for a moment. Carnal means, for the Christian, anything that is pulling us toward sensuality, pulling us toward uh, inappropriate thoughts of killing, of rape, of murder, of sex, of drugs, of all this kind of stuff, anything that stimulates the flesh outside of God. What if we had carnal words and a spiritual photo? So we have a picture of some preacher up there, and it had cuss words on it. Would that be acceptable? No, why? Because the cuss words weren't sanctified by the okay photo, right? Does that make sense? Absolutely. So moving on, what if we had a carnal photo and spiritual words? So for instance, we have someone standing up there without any clothing on and it has scripture on it. Ugh. Right? That's just like wrong on a whole bunch of different levels. So the reality is we're having a mismatch between the vehicle and the message. Hello? Does that make sense? Okay, so if any time the carnal element shows up, in this case an inappropriate photo, then it's inappropriate for the Christian. Now what happens, it just gets worse from here by the way, if you have a carnal photo and non-spiritual words and now the scripture's gone and now you just have something like you know, an, an, an inappropriately dressed or not dressed person, and they're saying something like, uh, you can do it. Mm. It doesn't work, right? No, it doesn't. Now, how about this one? What if you have carnal photo and carnal words? Obviously, it's a no. So the reality for the Christian is that we need to be up here where it is beautiful and it's spiritual. And then if we do embrace some of the non-carnal type things, but there's still beautiful elements or whatever in it, that's okay for us. But anywhere from there on, it just gets really worse, and we should actually ev never, never, never be over here where everything is just carnal. That would be just unbridled rock and roll craziness of every kind of lyrical content. Now let's apply it to music. The words must match the vehicle. Does that make sense? Okay, so now let's apply it to music. 
What if we have spiritual music, beautiful, uplifting, ennobling, and we'll get into what spiritual music is as we progress, and we had spiritual lyrics. They were, they were Christian-contented words. Would that be okay for us to listen to? Of course. That's what we should listen to. And by the way, here's a note for you. I want you to think of this. Christian music is for Christians. Did you hear that? Worldly music is for the worldlings. And we're going to develop all of that as well. So what if we have spiritual music and we have non-carnal lyrics? Would that be okay for us as Christians to listen to? Sure, no problem. I can sing a patriotic song if I want to. And when I say spiritual, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to, that it's, you know, it could be a march, it can be different things, and we'll get into this. But it, it's something that's not degrading the physiology or the mind. Is there a problem with this? No, this would be okay. But wait a minute. What if we actually had beautiful, uplifting music and we put really bad, horrible lyrics to it? like that had profane things or sexual suggestions, would that be okay? That just this sounds kind of weird. I've never even heard that. Maybe there is that out there, but that's just kind of opposite. However, this is out there all over the place where we have carnal music with spiritual lyrics. Hello? And in fact, the reality is that's a lot of the contemporary Christian music movement right here. They have a lot of the carnal music, and they've just put Jesus' lyrics on it, and they think it's okay. But friends, this is a house divided against itself. And as we go along with this weekend, you are going to see that without a shadow of a doubt. Carnal music, non-spiritual, just gets worse. And then, of course, we're back to just pure on, full-on worldly music. So the lyrics must match the vehicle. The lyrics must match the vehicle or the music, or it actually undermines the message even in the lyrics. So in other words, if you had a piece of music that's sitting here and it's causing you to have all this emotional kind of things drying, going up inside of you and emotions that are sensual or whatever, and you're thinking, you're supposed to be thinking about Jesus, that just wouldn't be okay. Are you with me? So did God create music to influence our feelings and thoughts? Absolutely, yes. Has Satan left music alone? No. So the reality is not everything that's out there is okay, and we want to expose that. God wants us to experience different kinds of music, and there are many different genres that we can listen to that don't have any problem for the Christian. However, there are some genres that just almost categorically are a problem for the informed Christian. Our thinking, Dr. Norman Weinberger continues on. He's, remember, he was that professor of neurobiology at UC Irvine. Our thinking and our behavior are colored by music, which seems to have direct and unconscious access to the brain substrates of much, if not all, of our individual lives. What he's saying is music gets right to the core of things. So, is there, there's one of the other arguments out there in the Christian world. There's no such thing as an evil or moral musical note. Are they right? Yes, they are. I kind of walked you into that one, sorry. Yes, they are correct. There's no such thing as an evil or moral musical note. But friends, this is not actually an argument, if you think about it. For instance, I mean, I could go over to the piano here, and I could play a note and say, now, that one's for sure evil, right? Is that how it works? Okay, how about, how about if we played middle C? Surely it's lukewarm and Laodicean, right? No, middle of the road, you know. No, no, it's not. But friends, that's like saying Q in the alphabet is evil. No, it's not Q, it's T. T is definitely evil. I know T is evil. Friends, that doesn't even work. Why? Because the reality is you can put together in the same 26 letters of our alphabet, poetry, scripture, or profanity, right? It's the way that they are arranged that can be the problem. The same is for music. The same thing goes for music. If we arrange notes and rhythms and harmonies and different things in certain patterns, it can be absolute beauty or it can be vulgarity. So it's really not an argument 
when you think about it. They're right. There's no such thing as an evil or moral note. But there definitely is an evil or moral note if it's arranged properly or not properly. Does that make sense? Like I said, we're just going to reason together over the next couple of days. We'll just reason together, and that's what God's people, are, what God is saying to do for his people. Listen, just reason this through. Dr. Manfred Klein, a researcher of neuroscience, uh, discovered this, that people respond to color and music in the exact same ways neurologically speaking. He went around the world, people out in the outback, people in the bush, people every, I mean, we're talking, they were in the cities, they were all around the world, and they hooked everybody up to all these electrical EEGs and different things, and I think PET scans and all this stuff, and they were watching what would happen in the brain when certain colors and certain music was being played. Everybody responded the exact same way, neurologically speaking. Now, physiologically, emotionally, or mentally, they might respond a different way. But neurologically speaking, they responded identically. Why would you think that is? Because we have a creator that created us. Amen? And he's musical, and he created us to be musical. I love that. All human beings respond, this is what they have found, all human beings respond to visual and audible stimuli in the exact same way. The same imprint is made in the brain. Language and culture had no bearing. And this is one of the great, great claims. Well, that's just part of my culture, though that's why I listen to it. And I get that many times from different cultures that have, um, you know, lots of music in their culture. And they'll just say, no, that's just my culture. It doesn't matter. I, it doesn't bother me that way. It doesn't, doesn't affect me that way. So in other words, they may not sit there and want to groove to a certain degree, but neurologically and physiologically, they are being impacted the same way. And it can tear us down, break us down, and actually cause mental problems, which we'll see coming up. So the reality is we may not respond emotionally the same, but we do physiologically and neurologically speaking. And so if it has the elements that can actually short-circuit the frontal moral lobe, whether it's in your culture and has been for thousands of years, it doesn't matter. It's still short-circuited. Another argument out there is that we sing or produce whatever music we want to because the Bible says we can. And they will take that from Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, so in other words, we can sing psalms and perform and produce psalms in hymns and in spiritual songs. Now, that's interesting. What do you mean spiritual songs? So what happens is many uh, CCM proponents or many Christian, and I'm a Christian musician, so I talk to a lot of different musicians, and they'll come up and say, well, listen, you can sing the, the psalms and the hymns, Christian, that's just fine, but I'm going to sing the spiritual songs. And so everything else goes into the spiritual song category. That's, what, that's really what happens. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Some believe that we can only sing hymns. Not according to this scripture. There's psalms and there's spiritual songs. Some think that we can sing and make melody in our heart doing anything and any kind of music that we want. Well, I think that's taking liberty that's not there. Some people have come to me and said, you know what? I, I had one man come up to me. I was singing at a camp meeting. I had just gotten up, uh, done from singing a beautiful song, People Need the Lord. Have you heard that song before? And that particular song touches me. I really, I really am, am ministered to by that song. And, 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 and many people are. And as I was done, I was literally in this space with the Lord, just like, oh, Lord, I really do. I need you, and I love you, and I want you in my life, in my heart. And this man comes up to me, and he almost grabbed my lapel and said, young man, what do you think you were doing up there? And I said, you know, I'm like, uh, just singing to the Lord. You were not singing to the Lord. That was secular, that was contemporary, and that was of the devil. I was like, whoa. Now, I had learned some things about music, and I knew he was not correct because the soundtrack that I had was appropriate. The way it was sung, it wasn't performed, it was ministering, and it was okay. But the problem was his hang-up because it was contemporary. 
as though singing a hymn that was 100 years old was okay because it had been sanctified by time or something. I don't know. Did you, you catch the point there? Because some people say, you can only sing hymns, and he actually in the conversation eventually said that. You can only sing hymns, and, and, and frankly, better if it was just a cappella, and you know, maybe a piano, that would be it. So in his mind, because it was an old song, it was okay. But the fact that this was a new song, it was inappropriate because it was contemporary. Friends, let's not get hung up on little terminology like this. When I say contemporary, that simply means it was written around my lifetime. Okay? Okay? Okay, so it's, contemporary doesn't necessarily mean that it's inappropriate. And the song I was singing was not inappropriate. And he said, no, you need to be singing. The, no, that was, a, that was a distortion. So these different people that say we can really sing whatever we want to because my heart belongs to Jesus and I get to sing and play whatever I want. Well, friends, let's look at the word spiritual song for a moment. This is very interesting because I got stumped on this until, because they'd come up to me and say, well, you sing yours over here, Christian, and we're going to sing all of our rock and roll craziness, whatever we want, because we're singing the spiritual songs. And I would say, Lord, they can't be right. Because you can't use the things of the world, the fallen world and the flesh and of Babylon, and, and actually uh, co-opt it and use Jesus' lyrics, and it's okay. So I looked up the word Spirits, I started doing some exegesis, and I started to do some study. And I found that the Greek word for spiritual is non-carnal. Amen? That is so awesome to me. So in other words, the Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and in non-carnal songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So the reality is, friends, it's not supposed to stir the carnal passions. The base passions. Thank you, Lord. Music is a language, and it should be conducted in clear and understandable ways. In, in our languages, we have letters, and letters make up words that make up sentences and paragraphs, and paragraphs make up chapters, and chapters make up books. In music, we have notes that make up measures, that make up phrases and sections and movements and entire compositions. Language, whether spoken or played, has the ability to affect our thoughts and feelings, influencing our characters, right? We've already discovered that quickly when we played those samples. Now, everybody look here for a moment and tell me how you respond to this when I say this. Ready? I love Jesus. You said amen. What do you think about that? What do you think about I love Jesus? It's great. What? It's good. What? sincere. How about over here? You do too. Amen. All right. So awesome. So you're responding to the words or the body language? Both. Okay, both. All right. So I could simply use these words and say, I love Jesus, and I can make a proclamation. So now are you saying that the body language and the words must match? Yes. You know where I'm going with this, right? How about this one? Ready? Everybody look. I love Jesus. What do you think about that? What? Sarcastic, negative, insincere, a fraud, uncaring. Okay, wait a minute. I said the same lyrics. I love Jesus. What were you reading that undermined the words? The Body language. Music has body language, friends. And so if I'm playing a song that's kind of try it, whatever, I love you, and I'm saying I love Jesus, I can undermine the lyrical content just with the musical composition. Does that make sense? Put this little tool in your notes. Because these are things that help us to decide the music we should be listening to. All right, so that would be like kind of whatever. Try it. Okay, how about this one? Everybody watch because we are reading body language. And in this situation, we, we read body language with our eyes. However, when we're listening to music, we read body language with our ears. Okay, ready? Here we go. I love Jesus. Ooh, what do you mean? What? I'm just saying I love Jesus. What do you think about that? Besides, ew. 
I love him in the wrong way. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Why? Because it was sensual. I love Jesus. Like, ooh, you know? No. I mean, if my wife said, I love you, that works. Amen? But I'm not, I'm, we're supposed to love Jesus, right? But we're not supposed to love Jesus, right? Okay, so that's the reality, is that when we, that would be sensual. So we could be listening to music that is, that it has great lyrics. I love Jesus. And it could be totally inappropriate because it's sensual. Is that making sense? Okay, so how about this one? Right? I love Jesus! I like that one because everybody goes, Ugh. I'm mad. Anger. I love Jesus. So what if I'm playing a song? I love Jesus. I mean, do you see almost how silly it is when we start thinking it through? <laughs> I know what's going to go on YouTube now. Unbelievable. So angry. It doesn't work. So the point is, that the music must match the, excuse me, the, the lyrics must match the vehicle. Or it's a house divided against itself and it doesn't work. Because what can happen is we undermine the beautiful words, I love Jesus, by the body language. I'd like to invite my friend Sean up. and we are going to go through a couple of different examples for you live. So pray for us. Let's talk about music. Let's break down now the basic components of music. Melody. Melody is the chief theme of musical composition. This is the official definition. Melody is a series of tones heard as musical thought. Mozart said, Melody is the very essence of music. Mozart knew a little bit about music. What do you say? Now, I'd like you to play a simple melody for us with one finger. Go ahead. Okay, so what do you think about that? It's fine, right? It's great. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's one finger on the piano at a time. That is melody. Now, melody alone can actually have motive, body language. So we could write a melody that would actually undermine the lyrical message if we weren't careful. Now, we're going to add to melody, the basic structure of a song. We're going to add to that now harmony. Harmony is the combination of simultaneously sounded musical notes to produce a chord or, uh, and chord progressions with pleasing effect. We're going to add a little bit more body language to music by adding simply harmony. Now, Joseph Hayden said this, Melody is the main thing. Harmony is useful only to charm the ear." Very interesting. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, in harmony, the perception of depth, perspective, mood, color, and atmosphere is joined to melody with harmony. In a well-balanced piece of music, the harmony will be supportive of the melody and play a subservient, though crucial, role. So now we're going to play the same melody, but we're going to add a second note with it, which would be a harmonic note. So go ahead. change, adds a little bit of color, adds a little bit of depth, it, it's a little bit more pleasing to the ear, isn't it, instead of just one note. Now, we're going to add some chords, and a chord would be two or more notes sounded at the same time that work in harmony with the melody. Go ahead. starting to fill out a little bit more, right? A little more body language, a little more depth. Nice, thank you. Now, we've already 
set this up, and you're going to tell me how you respond to this, because now he's going to play a little bit more over the keyboard using harmony and melody, and of course rhythm, which we'll get to in just a moment. Go ahead. How do you respond to that? Peaceful, soothing, touching. You see, it was the same melody and chords, yet we changed the body language of it. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's powerful right there. Okay, now how about this one? Go ahead. that one well how do you feel with that how, what's wait a minute what's the language telling you because there's no lyrical content here hello what's the what's the language of music telling you right now angry what who died yeah I mean it's like uh, it's like oh, 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 oh you know so but that's the point of music that's why if you were to watch a film without a music score, it would have like a third of the impact, if that. You could have a person sitting under a tree and have this, la, 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 la. it would be like, oh, that's nice. Or, and the camera could be doing like slow push in, right? Or you could have the same exact scene that's going, dun, 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 dun. They're like, oh, no, what's going to happen? Because music alone has the body language. Are you getting it? All right, praise God. So we have to think about this. Even if it has Jesus' lyrics on it, the music itself could be sending a whole different message. All right. How about this one? You're all smiling now. What happened? You went from this, you went, you went from like, Somebody died. So you're all like, amazing the power of music that fast. How does this make you feel? Happy? Almost childlike, happy, uh, elevated and noble? Upbeat? Amen. And it's a simple little song, Jesus loves me. Let's add rhythm. Rhythm is absolutely essential. It is the orderly movement of music the orderly movement of music sounds and silences through time so when we think of rhythm most people think oh you mean drums no 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 all music if it's truly going to have the proper structuring it will have rhythm or it just falls apart rhythm is the orderly movement of music sounds and silences through time just as the heartbeat is life to the body Rhythm is the life of music and provides the essential energy. Without rhythm, music is dead. We have to have rhythm. Go ahead and play us our first song. It's kind of a normal, common time. There's nothing wrong with that. It works. The message of the music is there and it will minister to you. All right, let's play our next sample. Right? It's like this. You're kind of going... Okay, so what's happening here? What, 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 keep doing it. What's happening here? Even just the rhythm alone is undermining the song. So rhythm has body language. Harmony has body language. Melody has body language. Or in the musical terms, motive. Okay, now, on to our next one. How's that work? 
work for you. Okay, 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 okay. Whew. Whew. All right. I think I'm just going to have to put new deodorant on after that one. Man. The reality is, if it's too slow, it doesn't work. If it's too fast, it doesn't work. Again, all we did was change the body language, the motive of the rhythm. Do you see how intricate music is? Go ahead and play us the last one. Okay, this would be kind of like new age music to where the structure rhythmically is sometimes not present. So what happens is your brain attaches for a moment to a rhythm and then, oh, oh, wait, where to go, where to go? And then before you know it, you're in alpha mode like this. So for music to have the proper effect, we need a piece like this right here with rhythm proper motive, all of a sudden it's powerful. The hair starts to stand up on your, your neck perhaps, it just did for me. You see, there's so much body language in music. It's incredible. Don't ever let anyone tell you that only the lyrics matter because friends, we haven't even talked about lyrics right now. It's all been just the music and the music alone has the message. Is that making sense? Thank you, brother. Quickly, as time is slipping away, speaking of time, let's go to 4-4 four, four time. In 4-4 four, four time, in fact, 4-4 four, four time, we're not going to get real deep into this because some non-musical folk don't really start to get it too much. But, so I'm going to give you some verbal examples of timing. 4-4 four, four music is what would be known as common time. In fact, it's so common, they call it common time. So that means basically, in a measure, each note of four gets a beat, okay? And you would count it out like that. So it would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And the accent would be on the one, or you could put it on the three, and it just continues to be common time, or 4-4 four, four time. For instance... Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. That would be common time with the accent on one. This kind of music is acceptable for the Christian. It is, because you're gonna, it's very difficult when you have a rhythm like this to put inappropriate melodies and harmonies and sensual things with that kind of timing. And God designed it this way. Now, we can also do on the first and the third beat. It would be something like this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Like a little kid would sing it, right? Da, da, dee, da, da. This is the accent on the one and three. Well, you want to sing with me? No. Okay. Now, what, what happens? Now, I could say, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. The accent is on the one, right? Now, how many of you want to dance to that? It just, it's not a physiological elicitation on that particular rhythmic structure. You might want to march. You might want to tap your foot you might want to nod your head. That doesn't mean it's inappropriate, okay? But now let's just shift the accent to the second beat. It would be this. Jesus loves me, this I know, oh, for the Bible tells me so, oh, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Uh. <laughs> Hello? All we did was, right? That's all we did. We just shifted the accent to the two. Do you see how much it changes it? Now, this is what we would call syncopation, a basic syncopation. 
and all sin. It's not a mysterious word. It just means this, that we've shifted the accent to where it should naturally be to one of the other beats that it's not natural for it to be on. So if we shift it to the two, all of a sudden you want to go, po yo, yo, right? How about this one? What if we put it on the second and the fourth? Jesus loves me. Thi- no, I'm sorry, that's not right. Jesus loves me, this I know, oh, for the Bible tells me so, oh, little ones too. Oh, there's like a posture that has to go with it, you know? And it's like amazing. Instead of, Jesus loves me, this sign. It's like, it's unbelievable how much it changes it, yo. <laughs> now, what if we just put it on the third? Just the accent on the third. Jesus loves me, this I know, oh, for the Bible tells me so, oh, little ones to him belong. It's, just, it's the same thing. All of a sudden, you're like, yeah, man. It's like you just want to like start kind of grooving and feeling it, you know, because what we've done is we've moved the accent from where it should naturally be, and we've altered it and twisted it. Here's what the devil has done. The devil has played with the rhythmic structure of lots of music in the world today, and it elicits a physical, sensual response. In fact, we're going to learn it elicits a whole lot more than that. We're going to talk about even the chemicals it releases, the sex hormones, and all that stuff that it actually releases. Incredible information. If there is a meeting you're going to miss, don't let it be the next one. Four four time, accent. Not excuse me. Not four four time. We're gonna put accent. Yeah, at four four time, we're gonna put the accent on the third. We don't need to do that. Let's just move on. Yeah, okay. Let's do a let's do a break beat. Actually, this is not labeled properly. Let's do a break beat. A break beat. This is more difficult to do vocally. A break beat would be Jesus me this I oh for the I tells me so, oh little do him be on. Okay, the, the point is you can remove beats too and it adds the same a- 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 anticipation, angst, and everything that goes on in music. So God wants us to be in a place where we stop tweaking the music so much to mess with our physiology, taking out the frontal lobe, putting us in the alpha pattern, and then the devil feeds us with whatever he wants. So let's listen to Common Time. Here's just a basic marching beat. So herein lies one of the greatest things. All drums are evil. No, they're not. In fact, in a couple of my pieces on some of my albums, there's actually a snare drum. Oh. There's some timpanis. Oh. No, you can play them actually properly. There's nothing wrong with this. That's what it makes you want to do. Oh. Not this. It doesn't work. I mean, even try to do that, it's like. It doesn't work. All right, now, that would be a basic four, four time with the accent on the one, accent on the one, and the three. That's okay. It's, it's going to be more like a march. Now, let's listen to a couple others. You have a conga beat. All of a sudden, what do you want to start doing? Right? That's what, yeah, that's what you want to do. Not, it just, uh, you know, it just doesn't work. How about your basic beat, basic rock and roll beat? All right? You, you know what I'm talking about. You have all these different beats, but we've, we've, got, we've actually got on to the two and the four. Okay, now here's a, what we're just classifying as a medium beat. We're adding more speed, rhythm. It makes you want to just kind of, right? You just want to start grooving. I got wiggles in my toes. Or you have like a club beat. You have all of this, this feeling and this emotion, and we're just playing the rhythm. Does rhythm have body language? Maybe sometimes way too much, huh? And, of course, there are many, many more different kinds of beats we can have out there.
So when composers alter the regular rhythm of the songs by shifting the accents around, varying the timing of the measures, adding backbeats and breakbeats, they do this all throughout the musical pieces. And this is where the problem comes in. When we, now, now here's something, this is talking about syncopation. Some want to claim that syncopation is evil. Friends, syncopation itself is not evil. Because you can actually use syncopation even in a Christian song and it be acceptable for the Christian to listen to. But huh, it can't be all throughout the song. Because then what we've done is we've taken and we've taken, we're supposed to have melody, harmony, and rhythm, and we've turned it upside down. And we put rhythm on the top and harmony and melodies all the way down here, and it's just lost in some cases. So the reality is we have to be careful with the syncopation that is in music. We can use it even as Christian musicians, and even some of my music has some syncopation here and there. Let me explain it for you. How many of you like non-seasoned food? Bland, no, salt, no nothing. Everybody like that kind of food? How many of you like seasoned foods? Okay, I live in New Mexico now, and most of you are New Mexicans, so... I know you like seasoned foods. And I'm like a fan of the green chili now, I'm telling you now. I like seasoned foods. And we all like seasoned music. And music can be, uh, excuse me, syncopation can be used as a seasoning on the meal, if you will. If you over-season your meal, what's it do to it? It ruins it. If you under-season, sometimes in a meal, it can ruin it. In music, the illustration is not perfect because you don't need any syncopation at all, and it's absolutely glorifying music. It's wonderful. That's where it kind of falls apart. But the fact that in our music, if we had a little syncopation here, a little bit there, and it adds a little interest, there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem comes in where if it's more than just a dash it actually becomes a physiological and neurological problem. So, is there any place for syncopation? Sure. This is one of my songs, Joy to the World. And I didn't write that song. It, it was around before I was born. But it's a song on one of my albums. And I, this is a section that has some syncopation in it. It adds interest, it builds intensity, but then it's gone. Listen in. Truth and grace, and it's and gone. Makes the nations okay, did you hear that? It started off fine, and then the bump, bump, bump. There was that was syncopation. It was for a moment, and it moved on. It added interest. If that thing was going bump, bump, bump through the whole thing, you would not buy my albums. I hope. So here's what the what God wants. God wants there to be melody, chief component top of the, of, the, of the structure of music. Melody to support it and proper rhythm to give it its heartbeat. But what the devil has done is he swapped it around. He's put the rhythm at the forefront, harmony, and then the melody is the least of the components now. So the devil likes to always reverse things around and switch stuff up. And when we do this, this is when we get into problems, physiologically speaking. The enjoyment of music. Rhythm is the element of music most closely allied to the body movement, the fleshly or the carnal, to the physical action. It's simpler patterns when repeated over and over, which is exactly what rock does, can have an hypnotic effect on us. So the fact is when we have that syncopation going on the whole time throughout the song, or even a large portion of the song, it will when they say hypnotic effect, we're talking about the oscillation between the beta and the alpha activity. And when we have that, uh, that oscillation between the beta and the alpha, remember beta is good because it's that scanning. All the critical information that's coming in is being analyzed. And we're rejecting it at that point or we're accepting it at that point. If we're in an alpha brain pattern, which is what uh, rock and roll and these other heavy syncopated rhythmic structured music uh, pieces are, they actually become a problem for the, the neurological um, mind, uh, the physiological, and, of course, spiritual. So the problem is we have to be very careful 
because the devil is out there and he's creating music that takes away that frontal lobe and producing a hypnotic type effect and we are being converted by his theology. The power of sound. They have also shown that driving drum rhythms in excess of three to four beats per second will put the brain into a state of stress. Regardless if the listener likes or dislikes the music, when the brain is in a stressful state, it will release opioids, a group of hormones that function like morphine to help return itself to normal equilibrium. So what's happening is when we're listening to these syncopated beats, in fact, what we've discovered now, it's not just the syncopation, it's what we call a polyrhythmic syncopation, a polyrhythmic elements. That means poly means many and anything that's rhythm. It doesn't necessarily have to be drums. It could be a rhythm guitar. It could be any kind of piano being played percussively. It can be any instrument that can have part in the rhythm section. So we can get many different rhythms going and they found, whoa, and even that basic backbeat, that, that, what, that type of thing going on, uh, the accent on the twos and the fours, or any other than the one and the three, what they figured out is that this puts the brain into a state of stress. And the, the hemispheres begin, of our brain begin to be agitated and, and the brain's going, whoa, we're being attacked or we're being assaulted. We need to release the hounds, if you will, release the morphine. And so we hit, get a morphine hit, and we're, oh, and we're like, wow, oh, man, I really like this music. And so we can elicit a physiological effect, a release of hormone that actually causes us to have a morphine hit. Oh, but music doesn't matter. It's just the lyrics. Um, no. Right? Let's read on, though. There's more to this. The, these opioids, when experienced off enough, can be addicting, and the listener seeks for the high again. This is why the listeners tend to move from less to harder music. So it starts out with soft rock, and then it goes to rock, and then it goes to hard rock, and then it goes to insanity rock. Because why? We're not getting that, that hit anymore. It's just like a smoker. They have to smoke, smoke more and more and more, or an alcoholic they have to drink more and more and more to get the same effect. Sometimes we're not even really loving the music, but we like what it's doing to us physiologically. We're becoming drug addicts. I mean, that's a pretty powerful statement to say, but physiologically, that's what's happening. These steady drum rhythms release in the body gonadotrophins, which are sex hormones, which enhance sexual arousal. Okay, so let's think this through for a moment. I happen to have young boys. There's, I have one boy, he's 13. He's going to start getting into those hormonal years, right? Now, is it wrong to go through the hormonal years? No, God wants a boy to become a man. But when a boy becomes a man, lots of horm and, a, and a, a, a girl starts to become a woman, lots of hormonal things happen. And sometimes their hormones become their enemy. Are you with me? And before you know it, they want to go kissy, kissy, touchy, touchy, and they shouldn't because they're not what? Married. Amen? So with a healthy frontal lobe intact, critically analyzing the situations, we don't go into nightclubs as young people that are hormone laden. Right? Why would we not do that? Because we could go to a club where they're playing all this music that stimulates the release of morphine, uh, and it puts me in an alpha pattern, hey, I'll do whatever, and I release the gonadotrophins. I think I want to do something tonight. Would that be a good place for a young Christian person to go? Are they going to win the battle? Nope. But guess what, moms and dads? We'll let them have a nightclub in their earbuds. Hello? I hope that one just went poof. We can have, we can have a 10,000 songs right on a little tiny iPhone. 10,000 songs that are releasing sex hormones. And, and it's hard enough to keep our kids on the straight and narrow while they're going through those years. Right? So now we let them listen to things that work against them? that enhance all this stuff that they, with a healthy frontal moral lobe, they're suppressing and saying, no, it's not time, but someday I'll be with my wife or with my husband and I'll have that wonderful time. You see, music could actually 
be one of the greatest curses for us if we're listening to the wrong stuff. Is this making sense? Loud booming, we're still reading on, loud booming bass music has similar effect, and it's no wonder that adolescent males prefer these types of music. They are either stimulating a release of brain chemical, stimulating their hormones, or both. So no wonder you got all these young people listening to this loud booming with the basses going, bam, 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 whatever they're doing, and the drums, and they're walking around, and they're, and they're cruising. Well, they're on the hunt because everything's being stimulated. That's scary. Do you think the devil knows what he's doing? Yeah. This is not funny stuff. This is life or death. Dr. David Eelkind. He's a leading child development expert, an author, a professor, and a chairman of the Department of Child Studies at Tufts University. Here's what he warned. There is a great deal of powerful sexual stimulation in the rhythm of rock music. The whole world sees it, except for the Christian world, because we just like how it makes us feel. Well, imagine how disgusting it must be to the angelic throng and even to God himself when we're playing the wrong kind of nasty music, stirring up hormones and gonadotrophins and release of morphine in his house. Man we got to warn the people. I mean, I think these music leaders and people that are up here, they're not doing it because they, they're trying to release all the stuff. And I just don't, I think they don't know. So we need to pray for them. And we need to say, hey, have you considered this? Give out the DVDs. Send them to the website. Whatever it is, let them see this material and then let them struggle with the Lord with it. Amen? Sound effects, another uh, powerful book. The sexuality of music is usually referred to in terms of its rhythm. It is the beat that commands a direct physical response. Rock music, by its very nature, breaks down self-control because the controlling agent is taken away, the frontal lobe, the crown of the brain. Jan Berry says, the th in, uh, in their book, um, let's see, Oh, this is Jan and Dean. Of the group, Jan and Dean, Surf City, Little Old Lady from Pasadena, Little Deuce Coop, they did these kind of songs. Jan Berry says this, The throbbing beat of rock provides a vital sexual release for adolescent audiences. They're saying, it's vital that we help these young people have additional hormonal releases. Uh, no, not in my house. <laughs> Now listen to this music. Right? Now, how is that music compared to what we're hearing today? It's like tame. It's like nothing. But that alone, they're saying, what we do provides the essential releases. And that's nothing compared to what we have today. But even that right there, as mellow, mellow as that is, it has the same response. Steven Tyler of Aerosmith said this, rock music is the strongest drug in the world. He knows a little bit about music as well. In Us Magazine, in an article entitled, The Little Known Things About Me, little, excuse me, The Little Known Things About Me, he says, quote, sometimes I dance with the devil. No, thank you. Donnie Brewer, drummer for the 1970s uh, grand funk band says this, we take kids away from their parents and their environment to where the only reality is the rhythm and the beat. So we have the rhythm and the beat. He's saying we actually take away kids from their parents with the rhythm and the beat. Why? Because it has its own message and it actually stirs rebellion within the listener. And this is the colossal Head banging crazy music that they actually created. It's not crazy. Some kind of wonderful. 
And they're saying, just with that alone, they're stealing kids away from their parents. And if you knew what I know about our youth and what they're listening to, I think you would be absolutely appalled. I go to academies all over the world. I go to uh, youth conferences and speak and share this kind of information. And I have young people coming out of the woodwork saying, man, some of that stuff you play, that's nothing. You ought to hear what... And all of a sudden, my eyeballs go like this, and they let me hear on their iPods what they've been listening to, and their parents don't even know about it. No wonder we're having problems with, with... infidelity in our churches and kids getting involved in in things that are inappropriate for their age sexually speaking because they're being taught this is what you need to do and how you need to be doing it and you need to do it now and we will explore all of this as we continue almost done king george the first one shining example of the power of order in music is king george first of england King George had problems with memory loss and stress. He read from the Bible the story of King Saul and recognized that Saul had experienced the same type of problems that he was experiencing. The king recognized that Saul overcame his problems by using music. Now, I don't know if you knew this or not. With this in mind, King George asked George Frederick Handel to write some special music for him that would help him in the same way that music helped Saul. So Handel wrote his water music for this purpose. Did you know that music was written for that? You know what's amazing is there's actually so much music that has been written specifically to heal the body and to help the body. In fact, the power of common time on the one or the one and the three, with balanced structure and order, the mind can actually be dramatically assisted in healing. But friends, when we start playing around with all of this stuff, the body language of of the music, we can undermine the message of the music. We need to be very careful. It's not just the rhythm. We talked about melody. We talked about harmony, we've talked about rhythm, and some rhythmic elements such as drums. But we're going to dive deeper in our next session. So if there's a session that you have to miss, like I said before, don't let it be the next. This one does lay the foundation for a lot of what we're going to study for the balance of this seminar. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to share these truths with your people. I pray that you would bless us with the Holy Spirit and help us, Father, to be led of you, not of man, but the Holy Spirit alone. I give you permission in my life to change whatever doesn't please you. Not my will be done, but yours in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, God bless you, and may your names remain in the book of life.